Major support for Carolina Business Review is provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. And Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Reform seems to be a current theme. Things like campaign reform, ethics reform, tax reform, health care reform, social security reform, etc., etc. The question is, are things that substandard that make us so intently to broadly improve our condition? Obviously, it's a rhetorical question, but it does reveal the depth and the breadth of today's issues. Two of the Carolina's economic development experts will lead off this week's dialogue, and later on, the president of one of the Carolina's largest community slash technical colleges, Dr. Candy Dietemeyer. Gratefully acknowledging support by Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina. Please visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Bearings, a leading global asset management firm dedicated to meeting the evolving investment and capital needs of its clients. Learn more at bearings.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Bob Morgan from the Charlotte Chamber of Commerce, Mark L. Williams of Strategic Development Group, Inc., and special guest, Dr. Candy Dietemeyer, president of Central Piedmont Community College. Welcome to our program, Bob. Mark, good to uh, uh, both see you. Thanks Thank for you. being here. Thank you, Chris. Good to be back. Chris. It's always it's always the dialogues, you know, off camera that that we're either laughing at or we're talking about. So uh, our apologies, uh, Bob. So uh, Charlotte, wow. Uh, that's quite a jobs announcement that the Charlotte Chamber has released just in the last couple of weeks about the, uh, and I probably ought to quote it this way, the largest jobs announcement in nearly two decades um, was released third quarter in Mecklenburg County. Where did that come from? Allstate. Allstate already has 1,400 jobs in Charlotte. They announced in the third quarter 2,250 new jobs, a great affirmation of a company that is doing business here already, moving jobs from Illinois, the Chicago uh, market. Uh, financial services uh, has led the way. Through the third quarter of 2017, we've seen the announcement of 10,000 new jobs. That's about what we did all of last year. So we're running ahead of last year by a quarter. Is that, does that also highlight the fact that it could go the other way pretty easily? You get, a, you get a major employer or even a, sub, a substantial employer say we're going to consolidate. Siemens recently announced that right. they could be losing right. some of those jobs in the Charlotte-Mecklenburg region. They're certainly right. going to do it globally. But th is that also uh, show the underbelly of, of the, you know, how this could be at risk? Well, that's a large announcement, right? So, so it does distort the numbers a bit. But look, we're busy. Um, you know, companies are announcing new jobs. Uh, the economic developers, not just in Charlotte, but throughout the region, are as busy as we've been in a long, long time. So as the national economy continues to do well, uh, we tend to perform a tick or two above the national economy. We're seeing that. Mark, you know, all smiles at South Carolina's uh, Department of Commerce and also uh, folks that occupy the suite that you occupy in general, right. economic developers and policy right. folks. Right. You know, South Carolina's had a head of steam going. Is How long is this going to go before there's a slowdown? Well, South Carolina has a, a great operating environment, great operational cost, and in terms of their state leadership, have phenomenal leadership in economic development. So they've been selling, they've been winning. Uh, like anyone that's been winning, we've, we're in an eighth or ninth year of a recovery. Uh, there are challenges, there'll be labor ch shortage challenges, there are challenges in terms of product, but I've never seen South Carolina do so well since I've been involved for 35 years. Mm -hmm. And if I could comment on Charlotte, from a site selection perspective, uh, I, th I see a long positive road for Charlotte. We just evaluated Charlotte for a headquarters. You're gonna see more of those. You're gonna see more of those in the southeast. Uh, Nashville is hot, Charlotte's hot. It's gonna keep, keep mm -hmm. going.
has the assets to make that happen. You know, uh, before we leave, I want to uh, you, you compare and contrast Charlotte nationally, but Charleston's had this thing going on as well, mm -hmm. and the growth of that region in the Low Country. Uh, would you say, how, how do you compare and contrast Charlotte and Charleston? And specifically, Charleston's going to be limited, obviously, because one side is, is water. Ocean, you can't right. do that. But can Charleston keep up with the growth that's that's now imposed on it because of these large announcements in the last couple of years? Well, Charleston's going to grow towards Columbia, and it already is. The Volvo project, which is essentially built, is, I don't know, 15 or 20 miles uh, west on I-26. So that's where the growth is going to be. Mount Pleasant is tight. Charleston is tight. Uh, Boeing has a big site. I would expect them to continue to grow. So the, you're going to see that growth to the west in Charleston. And it's it, it's going to continue. Uh, we're working down there now on a couple of projects. It's going to continue. Okay. Amazon, HQ2. Everybody's <laughs> talked about it. They fired this thing off from Amazon headquarters. And there's, there's, it's, I mean, you're smiling. A We're lot of smiling. people smile about mm -hmm. it, right? Yeah. So how would you handicap North Carolina and specifically Charlotte's chances? You know, it's a uniquely transparent project. And um, 50,000 is a big number. That's bigger than the Pentagon. So you wonder, <laughs> what are 50,000 people uh, going to do? And, and, and how do you put them in one market? Um, but, um, you know, it's a transformative type opportunity for whoever landed. You see what they've done in Seattle, not just the employment base of 40,000 people there, but all of the other tech companies that are now part uh, of Seattle's economy. Um, whoever lands it has that opportunity. For us, uh, we've taken a regional approach working mm -hmm. with the Charlotte Regional Partnership. Mm -hmm. Six counties in the Charlotte region submitted 21 sites. About half of those are in Mecklenburg. The company was not very specific in terms of we might want to be suburban, we might want to be urban. Um, so we have a variety of sites that are there. Bob, is it? I'm sorry to interrupt mm -hmm. you, but it, it, you talk about Charlotte uh, putting 21 sites out there. Is that is that unique for an urban center to do that with Amazon? Could Raleigh do that in the Triangle or any of the competitors out well, there? Well, this project is unique, and there are 238 regions around mm -hmm. the country that have submitted, I don't know how many specific real estate options. It's a lot. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, in our case, we've taken the regional approach because the parameters that they set uh, would indicate that uh, more than Mecklenburg County will, will be considered. What do you think the hottest buttons for Amazon and the boxes that they really want to check off? Well, I, Chris, pointing back to, to the 50,000 people that Bob mentioned, clearly their ability to draw qualified people to work there is is essential. I mean, if you take 50,000 people you might hire and it requires 20 applicants for each position, that's a million people. Um, that's that's a city in itself. So they've got to have the people. Um, they've they've got to have talented people. These are mostly, I think, averaging six-figure jobs or are close to it. Mm -hmm. So they've got to have a lot of talent. They want transportation. Uh, and they want the amenities that, that headquarters like that have. I was in Seattle a few weeks ago, and they sort of own it. You know, they own it, and it's, it's a wonderful place. It'll be transformative, no question. It, go ahead, Bob. Chris, the, the, the RFP is conspicuous in its mention of North America. Um, I'll be surprised if we don't see a, a Toronto, maybe. Uh, Toronto has scale. It has infrastructure. Canada has an immigration policy that's one of the most liberal on the planet. If you need 10,000 programmers from India, it's a lot easier to do that in Canada than it is in the U.S. where immigration policy is moving in a different direction. And, and right I guess now. you could argue to your point, and I guess we could start to pick this thing apart for all the attributes or the things that could hurt, uh, but you could argue that Amazon is a global com com company like Alibaba, much to the same mm -hmm. degree that it almost would make sense for them to be close enough but still outside the U.S. Right. Uh, Mark, before we let you go, th this Scana, mm -hmm. uh, the VC Sunder plant, the mm -hmm. um, the idea that uh, Santee Cooper and Scana have uh, so publicly failed in building a nuke, um, and now there's it's become uh, it's become a, a quite a th theater and spectacle to watch down there. It d does and, and again, I don't want to get too far down the road on this. But does does Scana's failure in in building the nuclear plant does it handicap South Carolina's economic development efforts? Since we're talk talking about mm -hmm. that because a utility is so important to the cost of power and the cost of manufacturing. Does this change the game for South Carolina? 
Our clients are concerned uh, in terms of their site locations, Chris, they're concerned about price, stability of price of electricity, and reliability of service. So if anything happens that impacts any of those factors, either positively or negatively, that's going to be an issue. Look, the SCANA project, there's a lot of discussion about the failure of, of SCANA and, and Santee Cooper from that perspective, and I can't really assess that. But there's also, there are also elements of a perfect storm. Uh, gas prices are low and plentiful. Uh, when this project was started 10 years ago, the environment was much different. We've had a Fukushima. Demand has not come up. Their contractor went bankrupt. I mean, in many respects, probably including some elements of management, it's been a perfect storm. Yeah. But that is an issue, no question that you raise. Anything that affects price or, or service is going to be a problem. All right, we'll, we'll have to talk more about that. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for at least the first half of the thank program. Uh, coming up, uh, his name is Mike Lord, and uh, again, a new leader in charge at the second largest uh, uh, credit union in this country is in Raleigh. It is the State Employee Credit Union. Mike Lord is the new CEO and he will be our guest. And one of our most interesting programs of the year, of this year and next year, at least it's a, it's a, it's a crew favorite, including mine, is the review of and the forecast of, and it's a two-part program for four of our, what we call our resident economists, Dr. John Connage from uh, Dr. John Connaughton from UNCC, I'm trying to remember this, uh, Mike Walden, Dr. Mike Walden from uh, NC State, John Sylvia from Wells Fargo, and also Frank Hefner from the College of Charleston. It's always a lively discussion and a lively group, and we hope you'll join us. You know, it is no small feat for our guests' organization to be acknowledged by the Federal Government Accounting Office, better known as GAO, as one of two of the best community colleges in this nation for workforce development. It serves 70,000 students annually on six campuses, three online sites. The school puts forward 300 associate degrees, diplomas, certificate programs, countless corporate training, market-based continuing education, special interest classes, and so on and so forth. Joining us now, the still new president and recently installed of Central Piedmont Community College, Dr. Candy Dietemeyer. Uh, president Dietemeyer, welcome. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's great to be here. Uh, so, gosh, I almost don't know where to start here. Uh, you came from the College of the Albemarle, down east. I did. Uh, spent about six years, and you went from the first school, community college school, in the state of North Carolina, now to the largest, or one of the largest. Uh, Dr. Dietemar, help us unpack this idea of growth in the community and the technical colleges. When you look at CPCC, surely you see that growth. But broadly, over your point of view and over the region, these schools have really been on the forefront of workforce development and the growth in the enrollment and so on and so forth. So help us understand where this is coming from. So I don't think CP is any different than, say, when I was at College of the Albemarle. I think the North Carolina Community College system and my, our sister institutions, we've really been trying to meet the workforce need. We've had a lot of conversations over the last few years about the skills gap, uh, building talent pipelines, and I think our record shows as a community college system that we have done that over the last few years. The economy is now better, but we tried to grow our colleges uh, in, in those needs to meet those needs through those 300 degree programs at Central Piedmont and certificates, and really that's based on the labor demand. What, mm -hmm. what is the market bear? And so all of our college, sister colleges have tried to do that. So we've, we're in the ninth year of this economic expansion. It's getting pretty long in the tooth here. So how do you, you mean, how do you strategize? How do you model out if it slows, when it slows, what that slowdown looks like, and how does that in, in, in affect enrollment? How does it affect the funds that you ask for for county and state? So when, if you're trying to look around a corner, how do you plan for that? Well, we're going to look at a new strategic plan in the coming year as, as Central Piedmont. I think our colleges try to do that as well, if I think about the region and the colleges that I've served at. So we first look at what's the market demand. We work with our, our partners in the chamber or the regional partnership and say, where, do, where are the jobs going to be? We talk to our community partners and our stakeholders. You know, we have a great um, apprenticeship program, but we understand the labor market better than anybody, I think, at community colleges. And so we have to, as you said, look around the corner and say what's happening. Innovation is happening. Mm -hmm. So that does impact what technical programs we offer, how many buildings we need, uh, what's our facility usage look like, and how do we build that out. We have a large online presence, as you mentioned. But our students, 40% are still first generation. 
And so the results show they need to have face time. Uh, they've never had an intersection in with anybody in their family to be in college. So we have to look at the balance of how much infrastructure do we need online to how much physical capacity do we have and then look at that in terms of the programs that we have. Mm -hmm. Bob? Candy, tackling the challenge of concentrated multi-generational poverty is a big priority in Charlotte right now. What is the community college's role in that challenge? Well, we have a lot of conversations going on about economic mobility, as you know, and uh, it's not something new in my career because I've had uh, a lot of service at some other rural institutions. And so part of that is how do we get individuals to think about all that we offer at the community college? Because economic mobility, as you said, can be generational. I mentioned earlier, 40% of our students at Central Piedmont are still first generation college students. I was with a young woman yesterday and we were talking about that very thing, the expectations of her family about what she should major in, perhaps more than what she wants to major in. And so we um, are the open door still at community colleges. We don't have an admission standard that requires. So if you need a high school diploma, which is sometimes still the first uh, credential that you need to access some jobs, we have that. We have all of our technical programs. Um, and then of course, for students who wanna go on to a four year institution. So I like to try to change the narrative with people. I wish parents would become great consumers of, of their knowledge about education opportunities for their kids and for their grandchildren because it is generational. So as we ha get around the coffee table or the kitchen table and start thinking about what are the options, I would invite every parent to come to a local community college on their college visits and think about the plethora of opportunities, the technical programs that pay much more than a minimum wage, the sustainability of those jobs as we go forward, and I think that that begins to change the generational conversation. I think it changes the narrative about community colleges, not that we're just a valued price point, but that we are a critical value about what we do better for North Carolina and our families, and then I be that begins to help, I think, economic mobility. I think we are the great equalizer and um, the land of opportunity. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Candy, um, in the site location business, our clients are telling us more than ever than their ability, that their ability to attract labor is key to their site location decision. There's been a, a trend of, of automation and capital intensity that's, that's picking up speed. Um, so in terms of community colleges and technical colleges, which are absolutely critical, as is yours, to supplying that workforce, how do you see the next five or 10 years evolving in your role in that area versus five years ago? What, what, cause, cause the market is moving quickly. The market is moving quickly, quickly. I was just on one of our campuses and we were looking at HVAC. So the students were giving me a little tour and it's not the HVAC technical based training that it used to be maybe even 10 years ago. Everything's computerized. They can look at a, a computer, that uh, HVA system now from their handheld right. device right. and already tell you what's going on. So we <laughs> have built at Central Piedmont as well as I know many other community colleges have, looking at what are the types of not only skills, but what are individuals gonna need to be successful in those companies you're talking about. So critical thinking. It's not just the technical hands-on right. ability any longer. It's how do you critically think? How do you interface with in innovation and technology? And we've built that as a critical core at CP in a, in a kind of a, a process that we do to help a learner not only gain the hands-on skill that help Bob and others begin to build their talent pipelines as they're talking to companies who want to come into Mecklenburg or any other company who wants to come into North Carolina. They want to meet with their community college. So it's, can you be at work on time? Do you have critical things? thinking skills, mm -hmm. do you understand the, the, the technical skills for that job, and then can you deliver on it, but not just as we're coming to your community, but long term, and I think Central Piedmont's done a good job at that with many of our uh, companies in, a, uh, in terms of apprenticeships and otherwise work-based learning, because it's the continuum of talent, right, and the continuum right. of training that we need to make sure that we uh, not only get a company to come, but also sustain them. You know, as I sit here listening to you talk about <coughs> culture, Dr. <coughs> Dietemeyer, around around the table with a family, but I also think of this idea, and th these are my terms, I'm not gonna put words in your mouth, uh, but when we look at four-year degrees in universities in this, school, in this country, it has become, again, my term, it's become elite to go to a school mm -hmm. and pay those kind of tuition costs. So when, from, a, from the standpoint of a, uh, a tuition scale, clearly community colleges are a much better value uh, just in that one uh, metric. So does, does the, does the uh, uh, dramatic cost increase in a four-year university, does that create some wind at your back 
to get more people around the idea that a community college is, is much more than just a place for an associate's degree. But there's something else going on here. So it's a great question, but let me turn it around and say that I do think there's a value and a need still in our country for a four-year degree. But I've spent 25 years as a community college person. So let me go back to what I said about parents. I want to have a different conversation. We all, I have a child, I have a child. I want great things for her. But I've started the conversation about what are the opportunities. Mm -hmm. And that narrative about the jobs that are now and the jobs that are coming is very different than I when I was a 15 year old girl trying to think about what I wanted to be in the world. And so my opportunity for parents and counselors mm -hmm. is to say, let's have an honest conversation about the jobs and let's look at the future jobs. What kind of credential does that require? Perhaps a student or a person needs to start, gain a technical credential and then stack it with a four year degree mm -hmm. or a master's. Let's start there. Let's talk about the opportunities so that kids, no matter who they are, whether they earn a four year degree or some other type of degree, don't come back and can't have a, level, a, a sustainable wage and can't have a family. And so I know parents want the best for their children. Let's have a different conversation about the truth of jobs and the purpose mm -hmm. of people, what they really want to do, and how do we put those together. And if it's a two-year degree that makes fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year, I think that's good. And if that person then wants to work and then go on for your four-year degree, or they want to come to a community college, do two years mm -hmm. and transfer and get a four-year degree, I'm great with that too. I just want to have that whole conversation so that our students and our children know what all the opportunities mm -hmm. are, because the world has changed. Mm -hmm and everything is not about a four-year degree, but everything's not just about a two-year degree. So let's have the honest conversation so that students really know what all the options are mm -hmm. so that we can put them to work. Dr. Dietemar is spot on because in the communities that we see that are most attractive to companies that are locating, they're working with parents and working with children to help them understand what their options are and what it's gonna take to achieve those options and how to stack it. Mm -hmm. And those that aren't, are being left behind. Uh, we just had Geek Fest last week on one of our campuses. I know that sounds, but it's all based on science. Every type of career that you could imagine, and probably, with all due respect, some that kids aren't even thinking about. Mm -hmm. And we do that. We had, I think, 16 or 1,800 kids from our, throughout the school systems come to the Levine campus to check it out, as well as our own students. There were things there that I must tell you as a college president, I was fascinated by and thought, wow, I wish I'd have mm -hmm. known that that was an mm -hmm. option, right? Mm -hmm. And so I want kids to be excited about their opportunities. I want people in our community, because we talk a lot about kids, but we have underemployed individuals too. I want them to see all the options that you can go cri do crime scene investigation, that you can be a welder, that you can do non-destructive examination technology. And these are great careers. They aren't the careers that we used to think they are. You know, advanced manufacturing is not a dirty ad manufacturing plant like I worked at mm -hmm. as a kid when I worked in the hosiery mill, right? It's a very clean environment. It's very high profile, very techno technology based, and it's a great salary. It's life sustaining. And we just need to get kids on our campuses throughout the community college system, and I know we all are trying to do that, and their parents or their guardians or the, help, the mentor mm -hmm. who's helping make mm -hmm. those decisions because if they see it, they're, I don't want to say they're wowed by it, but it, it, it opens the possibilities and they start asking great kid questions because our kids ask great questions. They're smarter than we are. And so that's why I want parents and kids to have, I want them to do as much work about the consumption decision, the consumer decision they're gonna make about their college education as they would about maybe the next iPhone they're gonna buy, <laughs> the next tablet they're gonna buy, the next car they're gonna buy, the next app they're gonna download, the next pair of jeans they're gonna buy, right? So if- Spoken the, if, by a parent who clearly has a teen. Well, she's nine, but uh, okay, we're well, getting there. on her way. Yes, quickly. on her way. And we've got about two minutes. Back to the employer perspective. Sure. At 5% unemployment, talent, talent, talent is what companies of all sizes are telling us is their number one challenge and need. What does that mean from the community college perspective in trying to meet the needs of employers for the jobs of today and, as you mentioned, the jobs of the future? Right. Well, we have capacity, as you know, and so we just try to continue to build the talent that we can within the companies or um, trying to get more students to think about us. We are going to try to always meet the need of those, of those employers. 
And so I think we just, as I said, we're open door. So we always have capacity. And as you know, if we don't have the capacity or the program today and an employer comes to and says, we'd like to customize this, can you put this together for us? The answer is always absolutely. We use our subject matter expertise as, long, as, as well as theirs, and we can bridge that gap quickly, as you know, all of our colleges can, to design something so that if we don't have it, we can quickly have it to make sure the talent is there. And Chris, I'm biased, but I would say nobody does that as well as Central Piedmont yeah. Community College. They're a tremendous asset to our economic development. You, you get, we got about 30 seconds left. Do you get enough money from the legislature mm -hmm. to do all these things that you're trying to do? Chris, it's been so good to be with you today. Um, <laughs> uh, you know what? We're out of time. Good night, everybody. <laughs> we, we literally are out of time. So you get a save. Uh, you want that president college job of the community college system? I know you just got to Charlotte. But I really love same, Charlotte. Same answer. I okay. love Charlotte. I know. I there's, know. There's, well, it takes a special person. They, they could not. No, yeah. I, I'm good. I like, being right, Thanks for being I like being right here. Nice to see you. Welcome. Nice to see you. Thank, Mark, nice thank to you, see Chris. You. Bob, always nice to see you. You too, Chris. Until next week, I'm Chris Williams. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, Bearings. Grant Thornton, Novant Health, Sunoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.